as a seam kit application. And I thought that was just the coolest thing ever. Um, and I wanted just to have that as a little bit more general kind of thing. And so I decapitated that application, turned it into a framework, and I can just load that framework into my Smalltalk workspace here. And uh, then I added some classes that I, of, of some slides that I needed. And then I have a big um, uh, object li literal right here. That's just, that's the presentation. And let me just go to that. And yeah, that's the um, beginning of my, my, my talk. And it's the, about the gentle tyranny of the call and return architectural pattern. And it's something that's been bothering me for a very, like, very long time. It's basically that we, we're writing way too much code. Um, I, when I was working on Wunderlist, it was a to-do app, 150,000 lines of code for just the iOS and macOS clients. And it doesn't really do anything interesting. I mean, not really anything interesting. You put the, you put the to-dos in and, it, and then they're there. Um, and I learned that at, at Microsoft that, um, you know, Office is an ungodly hundreds of millions of lines of code. And so I've been working on that for a while, but um, I couldn't really ever put down precisely what the problem was that I was solving, except for, you know, things suck, which is slightly um, uh, unspecific. And in, in terms of the, the, the song, it's like the question kind of is, where are these aircraft carriers coming from precisely? Um, and that's basically what this talk is about. I think it's about a mismatch between the mechanisms that we have, which are called return based, our languages, and the systems that we're trying to build. And to, to highlight just how in, in, ingrained the call and return architectural pattern is, I have this slide from, and it's, I mean, I'm not picking on Rust. Many other languages say this. You know, it's like, what is, what is Rust? It's a multi paradigm language and it's functional, imperative, and object oriented, which reminds me of the old Blues Brothers. You know, we have both kinds of music, country and Western. Because when you look at it, um, you know, what's functional? Well, F, F, you know, you have a function FX and the side effects are disallowed, except, you know, most of the literature is about putting the side effects back in. And you have imperative, well, that's F and F, 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 F of X and its side of X effects are discouraged. And then you have object oriented, which mixes, mixes things up a little bit by saying X dot F and the side effects are still discouraged. And again, you know, wow, this is, these are these are different paradigms. I, I can hardly tell them apart. Um, and it, what, what, what is interesting, I think, is that the paradigm of call return is so deeply ingrained and so deeply embedded that we don't even think of it. Um, and that's actually probably what a real paradigm is, is something we don't think about because it's just what everybody not even assumes. It's just sort of the, 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 the basis of our conversations. And the gentleness of this um, paradigm call return architectural pattern is that it's actually very good. And it's also very good at emulating other um, architectural styles, particularly if you have object oriented programming to in the mix, which really does quite well at this, but at a price which we will later see. And if I had to choose a single style, I would probably go with call return because you know I've seen um, Fibonacci done in data flow and it's just not pretty. Um, oops, wait, that's the wrong one. Let's keep going here. So, but, but then that was the gentleness and here's the tyranny is that we really, really just assume that that's going to be it, right? Not even assume, it's just the, the backdrop. And, and, and it's in the other, uh, the other way around as well, that if it's, if it's not doing call return, it's not actually programming, which you see from the, for example, the model driven uh, people, you know, they say, Oh, this is this is programming, um, and the software architecture people also pretty much do the same. And pretty much all our libraries, all our tooling, I, I exaggerate only a little, are based on this. And what's even more in, 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 um, um, nasty is that it's our abstraction mechanism. So other issues, other are there other difference we can abstract away. But since call and return is our is our the procedure is our abstraction mechanisms, we can't we can't remove it. So to give a small uh, demonstration of this, um, and I, I, I find usually this really only shows up with bigger, bigger projects, but um, I actually found a small 
way of illustrating this in, in terms of the, the GUI application as a simple temperature converter. I'm going to show it in the, in the regular call and return style, and then I'm going to later show it in constraints um, as, a, as a different architectural style. And I'm going to do the basic model and I'm going to add some UI, add persistence, and add another temperature scale. And this is the, the basic model. Um, I have decided that I'm, it's, the model is going to be the, um, the, the Celsius. And the far, if, if I, so I can um, set it as, as Fahrenheit, which is going to set the Celsius instance variable. And if I return uh, Fahrenheit, I also ask the, uh, um, I, I compute relative to the Celsius instance variable. And if I have the Celsius, I just set the instance variable. It's very straightforward, a little syntactically, it may be a little bit confusing, but I think it's, it's easy enough. So if I want to add some UI, I need to, um, at, the, at the top, I need to uh, add some, some action methods. This is for Coco that um, are hooked up to the, uh, to the text fields and they get the value from, from their respective um, fields and set the um, uh, attributes in, in, the, in the model. And then I have to go back. So that was just an addition, that's fine. But I have to actually go back to my methods in, in, in the model and um, so that they update the UI when they change. And so I had to change things around and that's not very nice. And um, if I wanna minimize the updates, I have, to, I have to do some extra work because otherwise I, I, I might get duplicate updates. So that's also not nice. Um, I wanna add persistence. And so that means if I just take, set the instance, uh, the instance variable, the Celsius instance variable, I also want to add it to the persistence, which in this case is the user defaults. And I have to, once again, I have to change what I'm doing and I have to make the updates work as well. I have to invasively change um, what I previously did. And if I want to change and add another temperature scale, well, I have to change, add, add the um, UI interaction. And I have to go back to, to all the other methods and update them again. This is obviously, just a mess, right? And of course, nobody does it that way because we have um, created various mechanisms of, of handling this mess, you know, and you know, I can just keep going with that acronym soup. Uh, and I'm not really sure any of them really make it that much better, right? I mean, this is pretty much where the aircraft carriers come from because um, the, the initial part is really very simple, but, um, actually just handling the distribution of all these values is very complicated. And it's pretty much unchanged since the 90s. I have a book by um, Brad Myers about user interface programming languages. And all the problems that are listed um, are basically the same. You could write the same book today. So what happens if we uh, express relationships instead, instead of procedures methods? Well, we model the um, um, basic model we, we expressed the basic model um, using these um, slightly strange um, symbols, which are um, permanent assignments or one-way data flow constraints. So they kind of look like assignments in Smalltalk or in Pascal, just with the vertical pipe. And that means this should hold. It's not, not very complicated. O obviously, if, if you had some more fancy uh, algebra, um, then you could probably just make one bidirectional constraint, but let's keep it simple. And now if I want to add UI, well, I can just add some more constraints. I have text fields and they should just reflect the value that's in the model and vice versa. So that's a bi-directional constraint. And if I add, want to add persistence, again, I can just add it. And this says that when we start up, we initialize the memory, the memory uh, instance variable Celsius from the defaults database. And after that, we keep it in sync. And again, we just add it. And if we wanted to add um, another temperature scale, well, we add a field a constraint and some um, formulas to, for, for the back and forth. That's really nice. And that's actually code that you can run. Um, I had a demo of that. I don't, I don't currently have it running we can implement it with Delta Blue. And, and you can do this. And it, it really is much, much smoother than, than trying to handle it all yourself with a real call and return. Now, the next thing we might want to do, which we can't really right now, is we might want to group this, right? Because that's something we can usually do with um, uh, when we have implemented something. We can, we can sort of 
group things together, name them. And in this case, well, let's just call this the memory model, right? The, um, the Celsius field uh, instance variable. And then the next bit is we group all the UI together. And we say, well, the UI should be in sync with the memory model. And in the next step, um, we introduce the bidirectional constraints, just make it a little nicer. And then we say well, that the memory model should have some kind of internal consistency checking. That looks really nice, um, except we can't do it. And it also looks very similar to um, the Wunderlist client architecture that I, um, and I used this texture representation of a, of a graph for quite some time. Um, and the difference being that previously, the, what I had, I could actually, I, 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 that was actual code. This is not code. Um, this is just um, something that I would like to be code, but I can't make it code because we cannot actually um, um, compose or decompose our constraints and we cannot implement constraints arbitrarily. We cannot use them as a general abstraction mechanism. And once we want to do abstraction, the only thing we really have is procedural abstraction. And that really goes back to a long time. Um, I found a paper by Wheeler from 1952 that um, already mentioned that subroutines have two uses. One is the evalu evaluation of the function, and the second, the organization of processes. So structural, that's our abstraction mechanism, right? And at the time in 1952, it made sense to use that mechanism that you had anyway for what computers were being used for, which was computing things and to organize the processes. The question is, does that really make sense anymore? And I'd say it doesn't because interactive programs are not functions that compute something and return. No, no single application on my iPhone um, works that way, that I ask it a question, I give it some parameters, it goes away and spits out an answer and terminates. But yet our, all our um, um, computing mechanisms, basic, our languages work this way. And I'm not the first one to observe this. I mean, there's a wonderful lecture by uh, Feynman on uh, computer heuristics where he says, you know, computers do not compute. And he says, you know, one of the great miseries of, of life is that we always name things slightly wrong, such as the computer. They're not computers, they're filing systems, most of all. And, you know, Guy Steele said, you know, in the, if the, this was one, one of those, oops, love, have objects failed or have they not failed? And, it's, and he said, you know, it's not, really, it's not really about completion anymore. It's about long-term, long-running um, uh, relationships. And Oscar Neerstras just recently has said, you know, death of object or into programming. You know, we were told we could just model the domain and that never happened. Instead, we're building all these meta model infrastructure things right next to the things we were supposed to be doing. And, and Andrew Black really put the point, very fine point on it. And that the program text is not really the description of what's running. It's a meta description that is a, that, that's usually instructions for con constructing the machine that will then run, right? Um, Because what runs are the objects, and we have these interactions, right? And um, there's a great paper by Mary Shaw, um, procedure calls are the assembly language of software interconnection, and that sort of made the case for having connectors and, and language support for connectors. And she meant it one way that you know, they're the primitives of, of, of interconnection, but actually there is a second meaning to this, is that we assemble our programs using procedure calls, and then we run the programs, at least in object orientation. And we can see this, for example, in UI, right? We configure the view, then we add subviews. We can't just say, well, this is what the view looks like. We have to write the code that builds the view. And very similar, the, the second line here is um, how to do a binding in, in, in Cocoa, right? And it's it's not, it doesn't say here's a relationship, but it says now you should bind this value to this key path and then it terminates. And then there is nothing in the program anymore, at least in the user program 
that represents that binding. It's somewhere in, 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 in the libraries. And you have a very sim similar problem with the, the, the black box frameworks. And I think I don't have time to go into that because I'm not, don't have that much time. Um, but uh, where, where every you know, black box framework, uh, the components induce a DSL and the, the writing things in that DSL and that induced DSL is actually very comfortable, but writing it manually, configuring all these objects together in a grammar that's impl Im implied is very, very arduous. And the, um, the problem there being that we have this gap between the problem, the system, and, and or the code. And for example, what, back in the days of Fortran, those things were very close together. We had computational problems and they were modeled as, as computational systems and the code reflected that. And then things changed and then non-computational um, problems became more prominent, but the systems and the code really didn't, really didn't change much. And there, so there was a huge gap between the problem and the system. And then with object-oriented programming, we could bring our systems once again closer to the problem space. And that was great, but that made, opened up a huge gap between the code and the system. That, that's that gap that um, Andrew Black talks about. And that gap really is, is you, you can see that time and time again, where people accuse object-oriented programmers, good object-oriented programmers, of you know, being um, architecture astronauts. And some of them are, but that there is, it is because of this gap, because good object-oriented programming actually does have this gap. Um, but that's hard to distinguish from bad object-oriented programming, which just uh, introduces indirection for no good reason. And then, of course, you have Ruby, which just goes off the rails. Um, but uh, and and functional programming is kind of a um, is trying to pull the systems back and kind of trying to say, well, actually, um, could we really just make the systems more like the code again? Um, and object to small talk, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, uh, says, well, can't we get the code to be more like the system? Can, can't we close that gap that way? And um, just talking about um, FP for a second, that's kind of the, um, uh, the yeah, the backlash against all this um, indirection um, that, that we see with object-oriented programming. And, and we see it in a, in a bunch of different um, developments recently, functional reactive programming, Java streams, React, Swift UI, and even async await um, are really, in a sense, they're, 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 they're brilliant expressions of being able to express things procedurally. Um, and, but they break down very quickly um, in terms of, in, 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 in that they, um, they don't actually model the domain very well, which isn't, which, which you, it, we really notice very quickly. And you just think by, um, you know, we have, for example, in React, we, we have another library every, every couple of months because it just doesn't quite fit. And the question then becomes, well, then why are these things so popular? And I think the reason is very simple because we can write down procedures. And that means that we can actually write this stuff down directly, even if it doesn't quite fit. And that's very, very valuable. I don't want to denigrate it, um, but it does mean that since the only things we can write down are procedural, we have to try to pretend that there are problems are procedural. And for example, with async await, I mean, that's, that's just foot guns um, with a little bit of uh, functionality attached. Um, on, the, on the one hand, again, it's, 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 it's really brilliant, but I, I, it seems to me like sort of the, the end point of sort of a, um, Ptolemyan uh, epicycles kind of thing. You know, it's actually, we're trying to pretend that these things are procedural and they're just not. And so, um, quickly to um, where where I want to go with a with a potential solution to this, and it's you know inspiration from Alan Cave. You know, you, you need to figure out the meta system. Uh, you need to do recursive decomposition so you have like components and you can keep re recursing. And the other part was Unicon, which is the universal connector language which came out of the CMU or software architecture work. And there, um, they actually had um, um, 
um, a system that generated code from architectural descriptions, which does tend to cut out some of the BS. And it turns out that when you looked at the connectors, they were pretty much a programming language meta model. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. And then from small talk, you learn that you can decouple the class hierarchy, your, your um, conceptual hierarchy from the implementation hierarchy, which with programming language meta systems, we've, I don't think we've ever really done that. The meta system is always very close to what the language currently is. And so the idea is, well, let's generalize to architecture because that's from objects and messages. There's no, there, there aren't very, uh, very many places you can go that are less specific. You know, that still say something while saying less than objects and messages. And then the meta model is a conceptual class hierarchy of connectors. And that's what we have in Objective Smalltalk. The, um, the capitalized T, as you might notice, um, apparently is what you need to do if it's not a Smalltalk 80. That's, I learned that at ESOP last year. And that's just uh, what, what it is. It's just an embeddable Smalltalk language. It's an Objective-C framework that interoperates um, with, with its environment um, as a peer. And it generalizes objects and messages to components and connectors, and it enables composition by thus solving that architectural mismatch that we're having. And um, so some of those components with objects and messages, again, we have Objective-C compatible semantics and interpreted, we can be interpreted in the native compiled. You also get to, to the low level C bits um, using type annotations from the small talk. And you get things like higher order messaging, which might be, people might be familiar with. And um, you have full platform integration. And which, you know, for example, this guy, I didn't have to actually program that because that was available on the platform and I could just use him as is and you get nice stuff like that. <sighs> Um, other architectural um, elements, pipes and filters. Um, I wrote a paper standard object out to so that you can stream objects um, easily. Um, that was DLS 19 and you get triple disk match message chaining, blah, 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 blah. And the, there's a uh, companion paper, hopefully standard message in. And I think filters actually generalize methods, which is interesting. I think that you actually, that's the filters are the more general mechanism because you can easily go from a filter to a method. Um, you can't easily go from a method to a filter while maintaining uh, the benefits. And implicit invocation um, with notification protocols, you just add um, a protocol to a class and then it registers for notifications. There wasn't really much to do with that. It, this was actually possible with the um, Objective-C meta system that was sufficient. Um, and then there's a bigger point, which is in process rest. And that's um, obviously what real large scale networks use. And that's kind of a, a little bit of a dig at um, um, the uh, idea behind object oriented um, programming being sort of a scaling down of networking of network computers. And of course that was at, at the time that was a Duncan experiment, right? Because Alan did not have an actual really large network of interconnected computers, which just weren't any around. And it turns out that um, when we got to a real large network, as we do now, um, most of the computers don't actually use objects and messages to compute, uh, to, to co communicate with each other. They use rest, which I find interesting. Um, and to, to scale that back down, in, we, we use um, polymorphic identifiers, which are URLs um, in the programming language. And then we have stores, which are kind of like servers and storage combinators, which can combine these. Um, polymorphic identifiers, again, uh, URIs and some examples. Um, so variables inside the program are URIs just as much as external resources and they can interoperate. Um, rather um, freely, and you get references pretty much for free. Um, the um, polymorphic identifiers are evaluated via stores. Again, these are like REST servers, except in process. You can also view them as composable dictionaries. And um, that's sort of the equivalent. You, if you say var hello, that would be the same as you look the scheme var up in your schemes dictionary, and then at that, you look up the key hello. 
And example stores are many, many local variables, obviously environment variables, file systems. You can go via HTTP databases. You can uh, treat other applications as stores and so on and so forth. And uh, last, last year I talked about storage combinators and the funny thing is when you, with REST is that you have very few verbs and that's a very narrow interface and and uniform interface and that and it actually enables pluggability and that's something we see on the web you have these generic intermediaries which you can just have certain functions and they work regardless of of the um sides on on, on uh, of the elements on the other sides and um using those in process um is uh, really powerful and um, a colleague for the paper, um, he told me that when I interviewed him, he said, well, he had about a 2x productivity uh, improvement, but uh, I later talked to him um, personally. And he said, well, I was actually lying um, because I don't think anybody would believe the, the actual numbers, which are more like 10x. Um, and here are some simple stores, for example, a caching store um, uh, just looks in its cache and if it doesn't find it in the cache, it goes to a source. And in this case, the source is, a, is itself um, a combinator, which is just a JSON serializer, a serializer, which is hooked up to disk. And what's interesting about these um, graphs, uh, these diagrams is that they're generated one-to-one -one from the source and actually could be used as source because these combinators just compose as simply as that. There is no glue to write. More complicated example is a an asynchronous writer, um, um, where the read works just as before, but uh, the write um, is actually not written immediately. Um, it goes to a logger, which um, notices the uh, notes the references, the URIs, the polymorphic identifiers I talked about. He writes those to your queue, which asynchronously then um, gets emptied into a copier, which copies. Um, via the references, the data from the memory to disk via the JSON. And again, this can be composed as is. There is no glue to write. And this is a more complex store hierarchy, which is actually used in, a, in an application, again, pretty much generated from the, from the code. And very quickly, um, to support this, now you can you can actually use many of these uh, um, architectural mechanisms from any language um, you want. For example, there is a port. Uh, this was an object to see you. It's been used from Swift. Uh, there is a port of stores of the storage combinators to Python, to um, JavaScript, and Go. Um, but of course, it'd be really nice to have actual la language support as an object to Smalltalk, and then. That's what uh, what's available. You have basic class method and protocol syntax. Obviously, you get the polymorphic identifier, so you can use URIs. Um, there's the composition operator, which is I use an arrow, and it's I use operator in, in, in quotes because it's not it's not really an operator. It says there is a really it, it's it's a defines there is a relationship between these two elements. There's the permanent assignment I talked about, and then we have class templates and property paths. Um, almost done. Uh, the meta system is is um, needs to change things around slightly. Um, before we had apply eval, and for an architectural language, we need to change that to connect and run, right? Because we 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 build these connections and then we run them. Um, the meta class class is a subclass of component. Message and interface are subclasses of connector. And components have ports, connectors have roles. They're actually very similar. Um, so that's really that's all there is um, to 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 summarize. Call return is currently ubiquitous, but it's mismatched to what we have. And resolving that mismatch, trying to resolve that mismatch within the confines of the call return um, paradigm. Uh, is actually, I think, largely uh, what is responsible for having to do these meta descriptions and essentially where we get those air these aircraft carriers because it just doesn't match. And, it, and, and we cannot abstract away from this not matching because it's the abstraction mechanism itself that, that doesn't match. And so what we wanna do is we wanna go from a 
this call of return meta description of the system to direct expression of the of, of the system and to do that of course we need to change the meta system and to a connector based meta model and objective small talk is an instance of that and then there is a, these are sort of some of the um connectors that are available higher order messaging polymorphic identifiers con constraint connectors storage combinators property paths notifications protocols blah 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 outlook um the i've been working a lot on actually making systems with this um that has worked quite well um but now that i've gathered enough data i can actually work more on the meta system and then of course the usual stuff documentation sample code there are some performance implications in this work um, because when we do connect and run, um, instead of apply eval, we don't have to have the polymorphism in um, uh, in the run phase usually that much because the polymorphism we can keep in the connect phase. And that actually, actually uh, allows us to, to be much more, monomorph more monomorphic when we're running. Therefore, we don't really need JITs as much or um, really crazy compile time metaprogramming to get good performance. And then that will hopefully come out once I finished the native compiler. And of course you need tooling. And what would be really obvious, obviously wonderful if people started using this stuff and there was a website, uh, yeah. Questions? Or rather, I guess you have the response first. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Marcel. And if people want to unmute and uh, give Marcel some applause, feel free. And I'll hand the floor to you. Okay, thanks, Colin. Thanks, Marcel. Um, <clears> There's <throat> plenty to chew on in that talk. And um, yeah, awful lot of things that I could respond to basically in a positive way. Because I really I really enjoyed the paper. I think everyone uh, would be well served by, by going and reading it. Um, but I do have a few thoughts, sort of counter thoughts to um, to some of the things that came out. And I I'm going to I'm going to start by by sort of sorry I don't have slides by the way so you're just going to have to listen to me but I do have notes that I will share with everyone a bit later. Um, so I would say that the, if I was to give a high level summary of uh, of uh, the the key problems that Marcel is talking about, it's it's something to do with state. Um, state is not well served in how we abstract communication. Um, so. If I was to caricature Marcel's sort of uh, example in the paper and the, the example with the temperature converter that he did talk about uh, briefly, it's something about how well um, we've got these different chunks of state that we want to synchronize. And um, it turns out to be really hard to express that nicely using procedure calls. We get this problem of you know, huge amounts of code needed to realize something that's quite simple. Um, so my reaction to the same problem when I was reading it for the first time was to say, well, can we make it so there's just less state? There's less state to synchronize because if you have a, uh, an application whose job is to basically hold a single temperature value and show it to you in different uh, units of temperature, which is what the example was, well, um, you could say, well, okay, that state is going to get replicated into the UI and into the persistent storage if you want to save it for later, and so you need to worry about synchronizing all these different chunks of state. But equally, you could say. Can we not just make it so that there's only one temperature value full stop right can we make that the the design of the system and if you follow that thought through as i did uh, i'll go a certain way and then try and open it up to other people uh, i think you find that that there is this this lack of of adequate abstractions um for state and so we end up reverting to basically throwing values around through through procedure calls and returns um, so where do I want to go next with this? Um, <clears throat> there's something that I think we're used to thinking about state as being in the middle of our systems, right? We think about a chunk of code that encapsulates a bunch of state. And so state is in the middle and some kind of messages or procedures or whatever they are, are at the edges of, of, of that system. Uh, and if you want to refactor the system as I just outlined, so that no, there's only there's only one place where we have this state that is a particular temperature value. 
if we really want to factor the system so that there's only one such piece of state, then we can't have a, a blob of state in the middle of our UI controls and also in the middle of the core application logic and also in the middle of our persistent store. We can't have them all be three separate chunks of state. So what would we do? Now, how would we realize that instead of trying to keep three different chunks of state in sync, could we just only have one piece of state in the first place? Um, so I do have a few more things to say about what that would mean. Um, sorry, my notes are a bit non-linear. So I was wondering, you know, why, 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 do, why is it the case that the default design, like if, if you think about the, this multiple, multiple replication uh, scenario as being a product of, well, the UI toolkit designers wanted to have their controls embed a chunk of state that is the current value of the control. They didn't want to outsource that to say, I always have to call some kind of getter or setter or in general, you could think about a lens in functional programming. I don't want to have to reach through this kind of lens or this, this object interface to get the state that I'm, I'm currently controlling. Um, then you could say, well, why did they design it that way? Why, why, did they, why was the default choice to be somehow doing replication of state? Um, I don't really know. Uh, you could say it's just following prior examples, like this idea of encapsulating state, state in the middle is just a cultural thing. That's one possible answer. You could say it's something about how, well, if you want to have the state be somewhere else, then you have to have this kind of higher order interface, whether it be a lens or even just an object in an object oriented sense, is a kind of a more complex thing uh, from a programmer's point of view to work with than having some very concrete chunk of state inside this particular part of my system. And then obviously that, that design gets replicated in all these places and that's why we have this problem of synchronizing different chunks of state. I thought about turning this into a Unix versus Multix thing because you could say, well, uh, the Unix guys radically simplified what, what they previously been working on being Multix and that threw out a lot of stuff that would actually have been really useful in this context. The idea that uh, in Multix, you know, there was an orthogonal persistence so that any chunk of state could be persisted. Um, like you had files and segments and they're basically the same thing. Uh, and and Unix moved to a much more sort of partition design where processes were uh, sort of, they were private chunks of memory um, uh, and they were separate from files that were the persistent sort of abstraction. And so you could, you could trace that whole pattern uh, down that line if you wanted. And I've, I've got a few more uh, thoughts on that. Um, so just to try and tie my thoughts together before we throw things open to other people. Um, I was I was delighted to read uh, in Marcel's paper the references to the 1990s software architecture literature. I think there's a lot of well, there's a mixture of nonsense and real gems in that in the literature, and it's uh, it's fascinating to sort of sift through it. Um, and uh, and I think the the Mary Shaw paper that that Marcel mentioned in the talk. Uh, I think the title really is is in some sense an answer to the question of why why are a procedure is the kind of universal thing. It's like, well, they are the assembly language and the assembly language is what basically pervades everything, right? It's what, it, what is gluing things together. Um, and procedure calls are the one thing that we seem to be able to agree on. Whereas if you want to build something higher level that might be fancier, you end up building some kind of framework. And frameworks are great at sort of trapping you in. Um, the sort of the pact that you enter is that, well, what I build inside this framework is much harder to get at from the outside. So. Interestingly enough, Mary Shaw, with, with the Unicon work that was also from, um, from her and some other people at CMU, was one of the few people I've seen to actually uh, write about how do, how do we break through the packaging of software? And there was a wonderful strand of work um, that included the Unicon language that Marcel mentioned uh, that was really about saying, well, we have functionality that we implement, but we always implement it in some kind of packaging, and that causes all sorts of composition problems. It's what gets uh, causes things to be locked in. So that's been a big influence uh, in my work, and I do think that um, if we want to build fancy abstractions of state, then we have to think very carefully about um, not specifically how to package them, but the sort of meta-level concerns that Marcel did talk about, which is how do we make those abstractions maximally available, um, and how do we connect them with other um, other bits of code, however we, however we might want to write them. Okay, that's the end of my thoughts. I've got loads more notes, but I'm going to stop now so we've got time for um, other people to say things. 
Thanks so much, Stephen. That was a great response. And we do have time for questions. I see several hands up. Um, I think the first one I saw was from Jonathan. So I'll let you go ahead first, Jonathan, and then Philip, I see you're next. And oh, after. thanks, um, Marcel and, and Stephen. Um, it's an interesting conversation with a deep history, a long conversation that's that's been going on. If I if I understand, Marcel, your your objective small talk framework is essentially what would be called, has been called often bi-directional binding. I believe Coco actually calls it that. And um, it's been reinvented many times and again on the web. Um, so um, the downside though is that when it's immensely complicated in the details, if you look at the Coco um, protocols for um, bi-directional binding, there's these, you know, enormous full page diagrams of all these messages going back and forth through various states in order to essentially time when changes actually happen and when updates are, are going through. So have you boiled this down into a, a, a clean linguistic abstraction or is it still a, a very large API that one must master? Mm -hmm. uh, so the bindings is a would be just a, a constraint connectors, and um, the one of the one of the big issues is is that all this happens in the background, right? Because there is no, you don't actually have any debuggable place in your code that is the constraint, or the binding in that, and for that matter, um, and of course all the messaging going back and forth. Um, in part has to do with trying to shoehorn uh, this into a objects and messages infrastructure. Um, and of course, there has been lots of work on, on um, improving, um, creating and improving uh, uh, data flow uh, constraints and other kinds of constraints. And actually one of the most recent papers by um, Alan Borning um, has a slight, a somewhat similar idea where they say, well, we want to have these constraints, but actually we're going to let the programmer implement how to solve them. And that's the big, the, the, the big difference being that you want to use constraints, not really as, as this magical thing that um, shuffles state around, but as a structuring mechanism that you can implement in any way you see fit. For example, um, the um, back end um, front-end communication in, in fr something like Wunderlist, because um, it's supposed to work offline, has to be that type of constraint, right? It's, it's just an equality constraint. We want to have the same things on the web as we want to have on the phone. Um, and But th there is no magical um, constraint solver or, or binding mechanism that will implement this for you. You just want to be able to, but you want to be able to state that it is a constraint, and then you can implement it any way you, uh, you see fit. By the way, including incorrectly, just like you can write a write procedure that doesn't write, but you know that reads. Um, we, the same kind of mechanism you want to have available for, or there's the same same ability to structure your program using different mechanisms, um, rather than being focused on this um, underlying uh, te technology magic. I'm not sure that answers your question. Yeah, I'm not sure either, but I'll, I'll relinquish the floor. I've right, got Philip and then Ollie and then Brian. So go ahead, Philip. Okay, so I think Jonathan asked uh, much the same question that I would, but more eloquently than I could. Um, but I'd like to use my, my question then to forward a version of that same question over to Stephen. Um, I may be asking you to repeat yourself here, but I got the sense throughout uh, both talks, because both of you are very well versed in the history of software architecture, uh, that this, this notion of first class connectors has been reinvented and resuggested over and over again. Um, and so I'd like to ask Stephen what, what you think um, is missing from, uh, from these attempts, and if there, if there does exist, a, a better example that is worth looking at um, as having having contributed something that may be missed in these perpetual reinventions of connectors. Right, great question. Uh, I'm probably not going to be able to give a very authoritative answer. Uh, I don't think connectors have actually been re sort of reinvented 
part of the problem, certainly when I, um, my knowledge about this is basically 10 years out of date, because um, I haven't really looked at it since my PhD days, but um, I found that the literature was very confused about what even a connector was. Uh, and that's something that maybe we could have, well, it, it would, it's worth, it's worth discussing, you know, what, what is a connector? Um, uh, do I want to quickly define what connectors are now? That's a really tricky one. Um, I mean, my, the, it's one of those things where I think the more you think about it, the, the more slippery it becomes, right? And I, I the, the definition I settled on was, well, it, it's impossible to, to fully delineate computation from communication, right? You have all these things where, you know, maybe this component is really just computing stuff, but it has some state. And so it has some communication channels running through it. And you, you really have to just say, well, I, I like to think of it as a communicational bit of functionality um, because that suits my sort of point of view. And uh, so it's in a sense, putting the modeling hat on and say, um, this, this bit of code has, has this bit of code or this feature that I've implemented has, has a communicational job. So it's a connector. Um, basically I think the literature is a bit of a mess um, in that respect. Um, so now I've lost my train of thought and I can't remember what your actual question was. Can I jump in? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, so um, uh, there is the, the software architecture people themselves were um, also among the people who always said, this is not programming and this is very different from programming and we don't, we want, don't want to have anything to do with programming, most, mo mostly. There are some, some exceptions. And um, there's one system which is called Arch Java by Jonathan Aldrich, I think. And that he said, well, actually, let's put, you know, why, why aren't we programming in this? But it's an extension to Java. And there's, um, so there's a lot of overlap between sort of the base language and, and, and the extension. Um, and that, I think, um, makes it slightly strange because you're, you, you have almost the same mechanisms, except now you're calling them components. Um, and that's one of the reasons I said, well, no, I need to generalize from this. Um, the other part um, with that is that um, I, uh, we shouldn't get confused with the constraints and the connectors. The, cons the, the, the data flow constraints are one very specific connector, which I used um, because that's one example I could find that sort of seems to make it clear, but it's not, uh, data flow constraints are not the same as connectors. They're just one very specific connector, just like um, call and return is one specific or a procedure call to be precise is, is a specific connector that then induces this architectural style of call and return. Um, in terms of one thing I also wanted to mention quickly is that this idea of not just, just simply not having that state, that's of course, um, what you know, Swift UI and React and these uh, UI libraries are all about immediate node GUIs, um, and it's a it's a very good idea. Um, it just breaks down very quickly um, because for the user, um, the the UI is a very stateful thing, and it's it's their view onto the world, and having the the UI be just a function of the model, right? That's what React, for example, says. I say it's a pure function of the model, and I looked at the uh, at their um, concepts page, and it just breaks down immediately. It's like no, it's not. And and, and like ninety percent of that page is like, how do we get state back in? You know, how do we get stateful components? How do we how how do we preserve the state? How we how do we figure out that it's still the same uh, uh, element that the user was interacting with? And you know, if, if it breaks down that much, maybe it's not the right model for you but actually we do have these two places that need to talk to each other. But it's obviously, it's, it's an interesting point. Maybe they are right and that's the way to go. And that's where you wanna have the, um, you know, the complexity is, is in trying to keep up the appearance that it's just a pure function of, of the state. So. Holly, I think you're next. Hi, so I, 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 I really enjoyed that talk and I, I think um, I was very curious to listen to it with the, the title that you had there, um, <laughs> uh, the tyranny of call and return. Uh, but because I've, I've been quite interested in this as an issue as well myself and some of the, the work mm. I've been doing, um, I was kind of expecting a, some elements of the talk to go a slightly different direction in terms of, uh, and, and you touched on some of these things um, with the sort of functions and the way they encapsulate. But I think another big part of the tyranny of call and return is um, the idea that you'll instantly get a return value. 
Oh yeah. And yeah. I mean, that is, like, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so, but so you, you end up with this thing where that sort of um, comes from the history and also you end up with a, um, a, a lot of the maths of functional programming comes out nicely because of the expectation um, that you're going to get an instant return value. And some of the constraints that you were talking about seem to me like sort of declarative ways of expressing things that many people would assume by default has an instant value that you, you know, that, that, that once you've set up the constraint, you're going to be instantly be able to rely upon it. Um, and in the work that I've looked at, it seems as if the, a key thing that gets lost between an operating system and almost all programming environments are interrupts. The ability to have some sort of message come in and just completely change, drastically change the flow of um, processing as it were. So the, the call return tyranny sets up a very specific um, dispatch tree. And if you look at, if you look at uh, my sort of, when I've looked at different sorts of models like sort of connectors and stuff like that, it's possible to think of them as just being alternative ways of describing the dis dispatch route through the processes that are actually going to run. Um, and so I was curious whether the stuff that you're working on, whether you, whether you're actually, whether you've got interrupts, whether you're finding ways to enable messages to come in and just say, actually, I want you to pause, for example, I, I, or, you know, actually, I want you to go back and start again, but with a new value. That's because yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's a super that's a, that's a great point, and actually, there's a, there's a whole side story that I that I didn't talk about, which one of, one of the places where where that was sort of you know that raised the issue for me was when I looked at the um, there was a user level I/O threading library for for OCaml I think, and there was a sentence you know it's like and um, compute level you know compute bound threads are a special case and handled specially. And you know, just okay, okay, okay. And then you think, what? Wait a second. Then what, what? If that's the, you know, if compute with threads is a special case, then what's the normal case? And if that's not, I mean, threads are about doling out compute resources, right? That's what they do. They they do compute. Um, why are we using threads for the other thing? That doesn't make any sense. And then when you look at it further. Um, um, particularly the whole IO bit, right? The operating system keeps up this illusion that, you know, we have a write system call and it's, you know, we call and then it returns or the read system call, right? But of course that's not at all what happens, right? The op so as happens very often, such as with microservices and other, other things, um, you know, we, the, the, the software engineering or software people, we, we, we have this illusion and the operating system people have to bail us out, right? And they, they, they make that illusion work by that doing illusion, very, very different things. And that illusion is essentially giving us the illusion of call and return. Exactly. Right. And it's baked right. into most virtual machines. It's baked into virtual. It's in, baked into the operating systems. Uh, it's you know it, it, APIs for operating systems. And 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 uh, with that particular library, then I thought, well, what would be an alternative, right? And I couldn't think. And for the longest time, I couldn't think of one. I just. Well, obviously you have to you have to call a function or call something, right? That's what what else would you do? And then after a while, I did think of something. You know, for example, I mean, you could you know extend the assignment operator or something. But even that broke down immediately if I said, well, I want to have now I want to have you know one level of abstraction higher. Well, that's going to be some kind of function call, right? And then you back with the whole problems. And of course, handling. IO with the with the call return model gets you all these problems with you know the stacks and having to manage the stacks and that's not really part of the problem at all it's part of having to do it with a, with a call and return model and um, in terms of um, asynchronous more more sort of an asynchronous processing um, the the data flow models right they they're they're essentially asynchronous agnostic they don't care and it, I found that really fascinating. Um, and particularly also with error handling, that's one of the big problems, right? It's like, I don't, I mean, the, the two pro big problems with, with return are one, I don't, have a, I don't have a return value at all because I errored, or I don't have a return value yet because something's gonna take time. And both of these are problematic, right? And um, with, with if, if, if you just 
pop, dump it into a pipe, you don't care. And the next element of the pipe doesn't care if there's a value or not. And if but, you have errors, you can just shunt them off to the side. But also um, you, so, so as I say, in the work that I've been looking at, I've, I've been looking at building a virtual machine that tries to handle hmm. um, interrupts as a sort, of, um, a sort of first order feature back into the language as it were. Oh, wow. and, um, and one of the reasons is because I think you could set up alternative forms of error handling. So for example, I mean, just as a silly example, but if a divide by zero happens, what you maybe want to be doing is catching that error and then going back to exactly where you're saying, so actually, no, forget about it, just use this approximation and carry on. So I don't want to tear down the whole stack. I want to, mm -hmm. I want to catch that error and go back. And, and, but the call, routine, call return tyranny you know, if you stick with most um, virtual machines, you know, you, you, you have to, you'd have to do a lot of work to kind of, kind of do that. So, I, so I think, you know. Um, yeah. I think the LISP um, mechanism, what is, what is it called? Somebody know There's, uh, that handles that, right? It's not called exceptions. It's, they have some other name for it. Exceptions. So resumable exceptions. Yeah, it's, they, have, they have another name for it, but it's, that's the mechanism, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, I think we have Brian next on the list for questions. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk and definitely a lot to think about there. Um, so at the risk of asking a possibly unanswerable question, um, when I see constraints, I like the idea of taking this constraint and then separating it from its implementation. But now we have the question of, well, how is when I read a constraint in the code, what's actually going to happen there? Where do I go to find out what's going on? And, and is there something when I see that constraint that I can have some trust in and exposing my bias, I immediately think, can we have some kind of type system that will enforce, enforce that this constraint does, mm -hmm. does, does what it wants? And, but I think the higher level question there is, 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 what, is what can be the higher level reasoning that can be used to talk about these systems um, so that when, when I read a constraint in the code, I can, I can have a model that I can trust. I know what's going to happen and I don't have to go running off somewhere else to try and figure out how that constraint is being satisfied or something like that. Um, Cause I, I, and part of the reason I think about that is one of the ways I thought about you know, this constraint problem is um, sometimes these constraint solvers, they're black boxes, you don't know what's going on. Um, so, um, and it's very nice to be able to read code linearly. So if the constraint was well specified, you could have a program synthesizer, synthesize a way to, some sort of linear readable code that you could read to see what's happening. Um, so I don't know, is there, is there higher level reasoning here that I'm not aware of or is there? Yeah, uh, yeah. There, there isn't at this point. Um, so type, I, I, I am starting to become aware of some uh, mechanisms for type checking at least sort of connectors in general. Um, I'm looking at the Arch Java code, for example, that's that they did some of that. Um, for constraints specifically, no, I'm not aware of anything at all. And, and, and of course, one of the things about, um, yeah, I, 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 I have to admit, I, I don't even know where I would start with that. Certainly one of the, as I, as I mentioned in, in the talk, one of the uh, parts of having the freedom to, to implement it in any way, particular shape you want is that it might not do what you think it says on the tin. Um, yeah. But no, I mean, it's definitely, that's a, I mean, that is a super interesting problem. I mean, uh, as far as I know, I mean, I, when, when I started this, I, I had a, some kind of idea that I bit off way more than I could chew, possibly chew. And I'm pretty sure that in, this entire topic probably has I don't know, half a dozen dissertations in it, if, it, if, if you really want to, um, I'm guessing, so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, if people are good to keep going with questions, Marcel, it's a popular talk. So if you don't mind going over, we'll, we'll keep going. Um, Antrin, you're next on my list. Um, cheers. I'm just double checking that I'm audible. Um, yep. Um, thanks to Marcel for a, for a great talk, which I really enjoyed both in its content and its historical slant. And I particularly appreciate the the tracking of the first introduction of evil back to Wheeler in 1952, <laughs> which is also he just described. Great. He didn't introduce. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's 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 been around for centuries, but yes. Um, so yes, I think this I think this notion of connectors is obviously correct in terms of 
uh, designating the desirable relationship amongst bodies of, of state by which you could call, I mean, and yes, and I also appreciate the links to what you could call a kind of micro rest notion, which also harmonizes with some of our notions of state. And I just, I guess I wanted to focus more on which, which parts of, and I, I, I don't, I hesitate to call it our problem, but I guess we're here in a sort of generally convivial venue and at least morally I think there's some elements of a shared problem design space and I want to see if we can delineate, delineate which parts of, of the problem have been solved by this. Um, um, I guess you can call it a formalism and abstraction and, and which, which have been left unsolved. And so, yes, I think that, that the problem about representing the relationship between bodies of state has been well solved. And as I see it, what's still left on the table is the problem of how we express the relationships uh, between bodies of state. Because as I see it in, in your onward paper, the actual design elements that correspond to the combinators are still expressed in a, in a relatively non-durable form. So the application design itself is still not expressed in, in the form of a body of state itself, it still occupies a kind of meta design frame of its own. And then just as a sort of supplementary question, I wanted to talk about the notion of interception, because in going from call return, we go from a realm in which, okay, expressing interception is a, is a, is a mess, but at least there are well-known mechanisms that do it I mean, AOP-like systems that, are, that allow you to, to intercede between sources and, and sinks of, 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 of whatever it is flowing around. And whilst it's very clear in the combinator model how you represent interception, you just stick a new, you know, you, you bust apart the pipe that used to be joining the two endpoints and you stick a new combinator in the middle and you say, right, I have now interceded. The, the question of how you express this in a design appears to be made more difficult because of the issue of, of naming. Both of the former ends of the pipe used to believe that they shared a name which a further author wishes to disrupt. So I wanted to, to think if you, if you had any thoughts about how, how to express, okay, I, mean, I, I guess the two problems mm -hmm. build on each other. Firstly, whether yeah. you've had thoughts about how to express designs themselves in in the domain amenable to combinators? And secondly, whether you've thought about how to express interception in the mm -hmm. space of such designs. This is probably a wide scope discussion, but I just wanted to, if you'd had any yeah. quick thoughts I'm, about I'm either not, of those. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not entirely sure I know what you understand, what you mean for me, because from, uh, I mean, I mean, the, the, um, we can actually uh, keep a lot of the intermediate stages anonymous, right? Because we can just say error, 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 you know, error combinator, error combinator, error combinator. And if you want another one, you can just stick it, you know, add it to the end or, or do something. And um, one of the things with both the pipe, you know, the data flow model and actually the combinator model is actually um, that you want to reduce names as much as possible um, because names um, are similar to, I mean, less, um, less strict than types, but even more pervasive, and they tend to prevent composability. Right. The most composable system I know is you know, the Unix pipes and filters. You stick anything together, and that's because there are no names. It, it can't not match right if, if it has a standard in standard and the other thing has a standard out then you can put them together they might not do anything interesting or useful but you certainly can and the more names you have um the less compatible you get and that's one of the things you see with with object-oriented systems is we have to introduce all these names and then we can't compose them anymore 
Um, okay. Well, I think that, okay. There's I a just huge... went off on a tangent, but uh... yes. Well, I think there's a huge discussion here, which I guess we will touch yeah. on in our talk tomorrow, because you know the, okay, the, the cool. there's a very interesting subtlety about what it means to compose systems. In that, you could say you can concatenate systems. That is, you can take the what used to be the edges of them and bolt them mm -hmm. together. And this is this is yeah. this is what the, the Unix pipe yeah. nameless system yeah. enables. Yeah. But that's not yeah. really what we mean by composing systems. What we really mean by mm -hmm. is take an entire system and compose them across their interior surface. And names are the only possible intermediary that enables you to do this and as i see mm -hmm. it names are crucial to the success of your system as well because that the right. success of rest is only possible because there's agreement that a certain local mapping of names between the, the sources and sinks of state are are, are aligned you, with each other <laughs> right you you, you but you, you just want to separate out the names and not combine them with the, with the functions that's what we tend to do a lot and, and we have this this arbitrary combination that doesn't make any sense anymore. Whereas when you when you have them separate, the names of the things and the operations, uh, then you get much more composability. And certainly the the um, the you know the reuse of these systems. One of the things I, I I've noticed is that you know, uh, for example, what I did for 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 this you know presentation thingy that I that I hobbled together, is um, it. Uh, it's actually it, for at least for 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 a a technical person, and I think we need to start with that, right? We need to be let's first see if technical people can can reuse these things. And I did that, right? I just I took a, this this application, I I, I took off the essentially its head, used it as as a headless framework, and then I could just you know reuse it in a different way so i think that's that's valuable and i think um and, and i think I, somebody mentioned open source the other day and it's like i think that's also a very important point is that you know open source right now isn't really working because who's going to you know anybody going to uh, uh modify numeric you know it's probably a million lines of code i mean certainly no end user is going to look at that and probably most professionals are going to be overwhelmed by it as well so First thing before we actually get open source in the original sense, really, of people being in control of the software, uh, is we need to be able to express much more succinctly and much more clearly what the parts are, so we can actually get at them. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you, um, Kartik. You're next. Um, I've been trying to wrap my head around the paper since I read it. Um, it's, I think I'm, I'm still new to this area. Um, today's talk helped a lot. The question I have is how does prologue connect to all this? Mm. Does prologue deal with constraints? Yeah. So, um, w once again, um, uh, I don't, I'm, I, I guess I made a mistake in, in, in focusing too much on the constraints, um, because that's really just a one, one small piece. Um, prologue is a, is a really interesting piece of this, um, which I don't fully understand how it fits in. Um, it certainly seems to be, um, I think um, another important part is that there are sort of two um, bodies or two bodies of work with regards to constraints, two large parts, which one is sort of the data flow constraints, which is something more of the thing that I'm concerned with, which are really much more about structuring applications more architectural minded. Then there are the constraints, real constraint solvers, which where you want, where we, where, where, which are very much about computing an answer, right? It's like I have these constraints, please go figure it out. And hopefully there's an answer and there may not be an answer. Um, and the may not be an answer part is why they're not as useful uh, for systems work because you kind of really want to have you know the system not be that unpredictable, and so Prolog I think goes much more in the direction of the um, computing answers side of things, whereas I'm much more of the structuring systems that don't really compute answers all that much. Um, although they're of course they're very interesting um, the developments inside the Prolog world, which you know that I don't pretend to understand really. Thanks. Uh, Pavel, you're next. Uh, hi. So first of all, 
Uh, thank you for the fantastic talk. And I have three uh, quick comments. So the first is I, I loved uh, the observation about uh, the source code being a meta description. I, uh, do you hear me? Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I actually think it's a meta, meta, meta description because you have those bytes which imply a tree, which implies the syntactic graph by resolving the namespaces and identifiers, and that implies the object graph uh, uh, after the first uh, sort of initialization phase is completed. So it's a meta, meta, meta description, uh, which makes things even worse, of course, because there's so much separation between what we are mm -hmm. actually facing and, we, uh, and what we are trying to express. Then um, um, you talk also about like um, those connectors. So sort of uh, there's, I have sort of, uh, sort of an observation that like our hardware is full of wires and connectors. So we start with something that has wires where if you want to sort of synchronize two parts of the system, you just like draw a wire and that's it. It's very simple. And we use these sort of objects, like the hardware, the CPU, the things like that, to implement something very, very different, uh, which has this call return semantics. And then we use that semantics again to recover this connector semantics. So we go like full circle uh, through a lot of we do that a lot, just yeah. to, to, to return to where we were in the first place. So it's sort of ironic, in my opinion, that uh, there is so much complexity to recover something that we lost along the way. Like uh, I work uh, in a company and we are doing educational robotics and one of the most complicated classes in our C++ firmware for our robots is the button class. Uh, the button, like uh, what simpler could you have? But it's, it's really complicated because it has to denoise like uh, the clicks it has to uh, detect the double click, so it has to have some state and long press and stuff like that. It's really, really very complicated. We actually thought about solving the problem at the hardware level, where we would have some circuits that would just handle the button and it would be like 100 times less complicated, maybe, maybe 1,000 times. Um, and and uh, third and last observation, you mentioned that um, there, or someone, I, I'm not sure, someone mentioned that there's a problem with sort of, um, Mm, data flow and and uh, constraints and stuff like that that there's this black box feeling that there's some mechanism that you cannot step through uh in a debugger and that um, might be a problem uh so i i have some experience uh in the context of prolog when you have the, uh, the con constraint solvers are you are used a lot and, and the way to sort of survive uh, is uh, that um, basically you use the degrees of freedom that you have. So for example, for optimizing, you, you still have to know what's inside the black box, but you do not actually reach into the black box. So you, you know how it works, but you influence things by reordering stuff while knowing which effects are likely to be uh, so, so what are the effects on the performance of the system? And um, regarding debugging, uh, you, again, you don't reach inside because the mechanism is very complicated, but you can, you can debug by adding and removing constraints. And it's just a different way to do it, but equally effective. So I'm just, I'm saying that um, because there is sometimes a lot of criticism of uh, those kinds of systems, but it's just like people expect that the debugging has to look like what they are used to, while you can have different ways to debug that are equally effective. So yeah, yeah that's yeah. So yeah, um, that's yeah. Uh, one thing is that the, the irony is, is is on many levels. For example, I mean data flow, right? So the you know we we often have a system that we that's really data flow but it's too complicated to express so they you know it's not expressed as data flow then the compiler does a data flow analysis and emits assembly language and then of course the cpu does data, does data flow analysis on on on, yes. on that instruction yes. screen so yes. yay um, maybe we could cut out one or two of the middlemen uh, and and debugging yes that's one i mean that's one of the reasons i mean tooling wasn't 
there just uh, you know as sort of general uh yeah of course you need tooling but also in terms of these are different different ways of of, of dealing with state and certainly for example a storage combinator um assembly you do not want to uh, debug that by stepping through the procedural implementations uh, you would probably yeah that was same. my point like yeah. um i know that the reaction you need different of a lot of many, many people like when they meet some sort of yeah. declarative systems uh yeah. they have this complaint that they cannot debug their systems yeah. and the answer is uh, that just the way those things are debugged will be different in some way and that's fine and and but you do need to provide the tools and i think particularly for storage combinators and the data flow stuff i think you can actually build much much nicer debuggers very visual and um, you know where you see a lot in the end yeah, yeah 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 but you have to do it yeah okay, thank you well, are there any other last questions? I saw a hand that was up that's no longer up, but if anyone wants to ask a last question of Marcel, please do. Uh, Matt, go ahead. We can't hear you. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, I guess uh, I'm just, I have a, just an open-ended question. I'm curious, um, just, uh, one particular area of interest for me is like traceability and the the kind of the operational people have kind of very intensely started building like graph based model systems to represent mm -hmm. particularly as we've started to introduce like as microservices have become popular um, debugability has gotten harder and as a result we've, we're starting to like map the graph of computation through microservices and generate like really mm -hmm. interesting graph based information or graph based visualization. I'm curious if you see any like correspondence, if that's like a different realm or whether like some of that has parallels or similarities, just open ended topic to see what you're yeah, if, I think, if you I think there are some parallels. I mean, I, I do think that the microservices hopefully will, you know, that that'll be reduced a little bit again. It's one of those cases again, because I think not not all of it, but part of it was, I think, motivated by again the the software engineering people not managing to actually you know be good enough at the boundary enforcement and so once again the operating system people stepped in and said well here's a process boundary have fun with it um uh the uh, yeah the debugging becomes much much more interesting um and we do see a lot of the you know the tracing tools and there's the e language for example had a had a debugger that worked with those traces and it seems to me that um, sort of your basic call tree stack based debugger is actually a special case of that. And that's one of the, you know, interesting uh, places to go. Um, and certainly um, uh, that sort of the industry is moving in that direction anyway, probably makes my job in, in terms of, you know, providing tooling easier um, because there will be some body of work to, you know, copy. Mm. <laughs> uh yeah basically yeah and um again once again uh, the one of the hopes with something like storage combinators and um i used them on a in, uh, way back in 2003 or 4 not storage combinators as is but but the in process rest stuff to actually take a system that was written as about uh, i don't know a couple of hundred services and i pulled that all back into a single jar um and uh it got not, not surprisingly, it got a little bit faster and more reliable as a result. Um, so, um, and with the in-process rest uh, uh, and, and with the storage combinators, I'm hoping that we can get some of that um, type of modularity that, that people are looking for um, with microservices. I mean, there are some applications where it's, where it's that, are, that are just different where you need the microservices, but often if it's just restructuring, uh, maybe you can actually do it with, with a, a bunch of combinators and a bunch of stores inside your process. And then that, that does make uh, deployment and debugging potentially a little easier. Okay, well, thanks again, everyone for attending. Thank you. Staying late in yeah. This was a fantastic talk. And Stephen, thanks for your response. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you, see you all tomorrow, I hope. Thanks, everyone. This has been brilliant. Thank you. See you all tomorrow. <laughs>